All right, Mr. Mayor, we are live on YouTube, so you can start the meeting now. Good evening, members, and those watching on this YouTube live stream. Before I begin this meeting with a minute silence in honor of the former mayor, Audrey Charman, and who recently passed away at the age of 88, or Tommy Robson, who passed away just a few weeks ago, having recently been awarded freedom of the city. And for, jo for June Ridgeway, a former mayoress of the city council. That's one minute, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to introduce members to Tanning and Black who will be saying prayer this evening. Good evening, members, officers, and members of the public. Um, pleasure to be with you again. Some prayers at the time of pandemic. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low. that We may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you taught us to love our neighbour and to care for those in need as if we were caring for you. In this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick, and to assure the isolated of your love and your and our love. For your name's sake. Amen. And a prayer for our city. God of life and love, we pray for our city. Grant us peace in our communities, honesty in our trading, hospitality and warmth in our welcoming, integrity in our planning and civic life, that the common good may prevail and your kingdom of righteousness and justice be affirmed. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome everyone to this meeting of full council. I will now hand over to Rachel as head of the Constitutional Service to go through some housekeeping points for this, me for this meeting. Mr. Mayor, in order for this virtual meeting to run smoothly, please keep your camera switched on at all times and keep your microphone, microphone muted, except when you're invited to speak by myself or the monitoring officer. Any member wishing to speak during debate should indicate by clicking the blue raise hand function in the partic participant screen. When I invite you to speak, please unmute your microphone and make your comment and then mute yourself again. If we run into technical difficulties, the meeting may be adjourned while this is addressed. If your connection fails during the meeting, you are able and you are unable to reconnect, one of the DEM services teams will contact you. I would remind members that all virtual meetings are recorded. Finally, as we are meeting virtually, it is important that members adhere to the rules of debate so it is clear to the public what is happening. 
I will be enforcing these rules strictly this evening and ask that members behave in a respectful manner. Before we move to the first item, I will ask the Democratic and Constitutional Services Manager, Pippa, who will take a roll call. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, members, when I call your name, could you just unmute your microphone and confirm that you're present for me? Thank you. So first off, Councillor Ali. Good evening, present. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Good evening, I'm in attendance. Thank you. Councillor Ash. Councillor Ash, are you there? You're on, you're on mute, sorry, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ayres. Good evening, I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Barkham. Present. Thank you. Councillor Bashir. Good evening, in attendance. Thank you. Councillor Bisbee. Good evening, how are you? Thank you. Councillor Andrew Bond. Present. Thank you. Councillor Sandra Bond. Good evening, I am present. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Good evening, I am present. Thank you. Councillor Burbage. Good evening, present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Casey. Good evening, I am present. Thank you. Councillor Soresti. Here. Thank you. Councillor Andy Coles. I'm present, Pepper. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Day. Good evening, present. Thank you. Um, I don't believe we have Councillor Dowson yet. Councillor Dowson, are you here? No, not yet. Councillor Ellis. Present. Thank you. Councillor Farouk. Present. Thank you. Councillor Fitzgerald. Yes, I'm here, Pippa. Present. Thank you. Councillor Fower. Present. Thank you very much. Councillor John Fox. Present. Thank you. Councillor Judy Fox. Present. Thank you. We have apologies from Councillor Goodwin. Councillor Harper. Yes, present, Pippa. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haynes. Present. Thank you. Councillor Hemraj. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hiller. Yes, I'm here, Pippa. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Hogg. Present. Thank you. Councillor Holditch. Good evening. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Howard. Good evening, present. Thank you. Councillor Howell. Good evening, present. Thank you. Councillor Hussein. Good evening, all. I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Amjad Iqbal. Good evening, present. Thank you. Councillor Azar Iqbal. Present. present. Thank you. Councillor Jamil. Present. Good evening. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Present. Thank you very much, Councillor Joseph. Councillor Joseph, sorry, can you again? Hey, good evening, Pippa. I'm yep. present. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lamb. Present. Good, good evening. evening. Thank you very much, Councillor Lane. Present. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Lane. Councillor Lillis. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Pippa. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Present. Thank you. Councillor Nadim. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gulnawaz. Yeah. Oh, sorry, can you say that again, Councillor Nawaz? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Councillor Shaz Nawaz. I'm here. Thank you for asking, Pippa. Thank you. Councillor Over. Present, Pippa. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Quam, I believe, is going to be late this evening, so she's not here yet. Um, Councillor Robinson. Yes, good evening, Pippa. Thank you. Councillor Rush. Present. Thank you. Councillor Sanford. Yes, good evening. Thank you. Councillor Deaton. Present. Thank you. Councillor Shaheed. Evening, Pippa. I'm here. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Simons. Uh, good evening. Yeah, I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Skibstead. Yeah, present. Unable to use the video at the moment. Thank you very much. Councillor Warren. Present. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Um, Councillor Walsh. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Councillor Wiggin. Present. Thank you. Councillor Yasin. Good evening. I'm present. Thank you, Pippa. I hope everyone's well. 
Thank you. And finally, Councillor Yagatine. Good evening, President. Thank you very much. Um, that is everyone present and accounted for. Mr Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pippa. Uh, agenda item one, apology for absent. Are there any further apologies? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, we've had apologies from Councillor Goodwin and Councillor Aitken. Are there any others this evening that we don't know about, that we haven't been told about? No, doesn't look like it. That's it then, thank you. Agenda item two, declaration of interest. Are there any declaration of interest from members this evening which are not already recorded separately on their individual register of interest? There are no hands raised, Mr. Mayor. Agenda item three, minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of July, 2020. I would like to move approval of the minutes of the special council meeting held on the 29th July, 2020. Do I have a seconder? I beg to second, Mr. Mayor. Members, if there is any objection to this proposal, please raise your virtual blue hand now. If there is no objection, I will take this as agreed. Thank you, that is agreed. I would now like to now to move approval of the minutes of the ordinary council meeting held on the 29th of July, 2020. Do I have a second? Happen to second, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, members. If there is any objection to this proposal, please raise your virtual blue hand now. And if there is no objection, I will take this as agreed. Uh, Councillor Murphy, you have your hand raised. Yes, um, it, Mr. Mayor, on page 21, item 7, it stated that, that the Mayor had received confirmation from Councillor Murphy prior to the meeting that he no longer wished to move his motion. Now, I know there was some discussion after this afterwards, and the Head of Democratic Services gave an excellent explanation as to what happened, but... Um, Mr. Mayor, you probably know this motion was the one about uh, perhaps us seeking to take a cut in remuneration, particularly for the mayoral post, so you may well remember it. Did you receive from me directly confirmation that I didn't wish to move this? I know there was a bit of confusion at the meeting because around about this time we didn't know whether it was a three or four hour meeting and the guillotine came down. The standing orders and the process is quite clear. When the guillotine comes down, it should be assumed that all those motions have been proposed and seconded and then they go to the vote. It's at that stage that somebody may withdraw it. Mr. Mayor, did you receive prior notification from me? Uh, I, will, I will get back to you, uh, Councilor Murphy, on, on, on later, all right? Can I suggest, with the exception of this particular item, the minutes are accepted? Yeah, is everybody OK with that? Perfect. Yes, we'll do that, Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Can, can I challenge that, please? Be because the, the, the minutes are an accurate record of what happened at the meeting and what was said at the meeting. The, the mayor may well not have had something uh, directly from Councillor Murphy, but that's up to governance to uh, uh, to do that. He was advised by governance that he had withdrawn it. So I, I, I think the minutes are correct. Councillor Murphy, are you saying that you didn't withdraw your motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, again, I asked you, Mr. Mayor, did you receive it from me? The fact of the matter is, no, I did. I did not withdraw my motion prior to the meeting. So the, the minute is incorrect. Uh, I didn't withdraw it. I don't think we need to labour the point. It's just an error. Um, and I know there was some confusion because the guillotine came down. And it's, it is a little bit confusing. The guillotine says one thing. Um, 
but certainly the mayor may have had word of my intention to withdraw, but I had not withdrawn it. Councillor Fitzgerald. In order to move us on, Mr. Mayor, uh, all the all the meetings are recorded. Can we ask that Democratic Services uh, report back what to, was actually recorded in the meeting, and that will satisfy everybody. Pippa, are you going to do that? Yes, yes, I can. I can go back to the to the uh, following this meeting. I can go back and confirm what what actually happened and update the minutes accordingly. Councillor Hock, would it not be possible um, for members so the the, uh, the minutes are um, circulated well in advance of uh, the meeting that in future um, to to make representations to democratic services to say that there are issues with the minutes um, and, and see if they can be cleared up uh, before the meeting. Uh, this just seems to be a, a general waste of time. Thank you, Councillor Hogg. Uh, Councillor Soresto. Uh, thank, thank you. I'm sorry, I was having difficulty on un unmuting myself. And um, I have to agree with Councillor Holditch. From the little that I recall, um, you know, the minutes are accurate and they are accurate as they are written. Now, there may be a dispute about what was uh, uh, intended, but that's not what's in the minutes. Now, um, may I suggest that I also agree with what Councillor Hogg has just said, that quite frankly, We've all had enough time to look at these minutes. Why was this discussion not taken up much prior to council meetings? We're wasting really good and valuable council time. Can we move on, please? Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Murphy? Yes, I agree. Let's move on. Um, I did speak to the Secretariat prior to this meeting about this particular item. Uh, and we've now agreed that that's what we want to do. So there was prior notice. The fact of the matter is I did not withdraw the motion. Note that and let's move on. Thank you, Councillor Seaton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the Constitution and Ethics Committee met on the 12th of October and we did actually agree, and it is on the agenda today, that um, members should notify officers of what they consider to be any substantive omissions or factually incorrect information by 12 noon of the, the day of the meeting. So that point is covered for the future. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Please move on. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you can move to item four now. Thank you. <clears throat> Agenda item four and item five, mayor's announcement and leader's announcement. I am pleased to say that, say that 7,228 7, pounds has been raised during 2019-20 for my nominated HRTs. This sum will be divided evenly between Caring together, friend of Peterborough Hospital and Little Miracles. There are no an announcements from the leader this evening. <clears throat> Agenda item six, question with notice by members of the public. There have been seven questions submitted by members of the public this evening. Before we begin, please be advised that once your allocated time for speaking is over, an alarm will be heard, and this is your sign to stop speaking. This will be the case for all public and members speaking all each item 
this evening. Question one from Mr. Hanford. Mr. Hanford, would you like to ask your question relating to city fiber? Thank you. My question is as follows. After six emails to its complaints resolution team, followed up by a number of telephone calls and numerous broken promises, I am now ignored by City Fibre. The company contracted by this council to bring Gigabyte Internet to Peterborough. Complaint resolution is, according to City Fibre, a response within one day and a resolution within five days. Does the cabinet still believe that City Fibre is a reputable and trustworthy company? And does it feel it is acceptable practice for City Fibre to damage a resident's property whilst carrying out works and then fail to deal with the resident's complaint or even provide a written apology? Councillor Farouk, would you like to respond? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Hanford, for your question. I'm pleased to say we have requested and received Mr. Hanford's contact details so that we can ensure that there is an investigation of the issues involving in this case. City Fibre, like other utility companies, have customer service standards, which would be passed to any contractor responsible for any works carried out on their behalf. I can confirm these standards are that City Fibre, as Mr. Hanford pointed out, aim to make initial contact within 24 hours and resolve general inquiries within five days. Any more complex issues such as those involving their subcontractors are within 10 days. During the last six months, the performance in Peterborough has been across all types averaging at 5.7 days. As with any large scale infrastructure project issues can occur, which we would expect to be handled in a correct and timely manner. I have received assurances that this matter is being dealt with by City Fibre, who are liaising directly with Mr. Hanford and the contractor responsible. The City Council has worked closely with City Fibre for years to develop and expand the reach of their full fibre network. It has become a platform for our smart city initiatives, helps us attract businesses and develop our emerging tax sector, and is a great boost to our city. This is why we take seriously any concerns raised by residents such as Mr. Hanford. Thank you. Mr. Hanford, uh, do you have a follow-up question? City Fiber for years to develop and expand the reach of their full fiber network. It has become a platform for our smart city initiatives. Mr. Hanford, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, I do. My question is, do City Fibre have appropriate liability insurance? And if so, why have they not provided this information in light of their failure to provide a prompt resolution? Councillor Farouk, do you want to come back? Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Hanford, I'm... I'm I'm, I'm sure with all the organizations, uh, City Fibre do, do have their public liability insurance or any work they carry out. Uh, as, as you know, legally, every business in every sector needs to have that public liability insurance. And, and you know, furthermore, once the contractor completes the work, uh, we our city council officers do a walk with the City Fibre uh, and put right any defects caused by, caused by their subcontractor. Uh, I hope that's satisfactory. Thank you. Question two from Mr. Chapman. Mr. Chapman, would you like to ask your question relating to road micro surface? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, everyone. The Council's policy of treating roads by micro surfacing them has undesirable consequences. As well as making residential streets look messy and unkempt, the tiny thro stones thrown up by cars passing over the surface can cause damage to these vehicles, plus those parked on the roadway. Will the council pay for the repair of the damage caused? I'm sure most residents would rather wait a few more years for the council to resurface the roads properly. Why has this microsurfacing technique been deployed in Peterborough when it comes with so many problems? 
Councillor Hiller, would you like to respond, please? Councillor Hiller. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the, uh, for the opportunity. Um, good evening, Mr. Chapman. Um, the micro surfacing you, you ask about has been used on Peterborough's roads for, for a number of years and, and is a recognised process used throughout the highways industry in the UK to extend the life of carriageways. Um, the treatment forms part of the council's annual highways programme. And once the material is laid, um, our contractor erects uh, loose chipping signage, speed advisory signage along the road, any particular road that is being treated to, to warn road users about the loose material and to lower their speeds to prevent or certainly mitigate um, the effect you allude to in, in your question. Um, Depending on how busy the road is, the scattering effect caused by vehicles is fairly soon reduced. And once the material has had time to settle, the carriageway is swept thoroughly within a week or so to collect all possible loose material for, for reuse elsewhere. Um, following the completion of the works, officers and the contractor then visit the locations where the micro surfacing is laid to carry out a final inspection and undertake any remedial works should they be necessary uh, mr chapman if, if you have any examples of vehicle damage I, I would certainly like to see those examples and and they will be analyzed i can assure you they will be analyzed by our highway services uh, th thank you mr chapman thank you mr man thank you mr chapman do you have a follow-up question uh, yeah. yes mr mayor i do um Firstly, with regard to the response just given, uh, I walked across that road only the other day. There were still numerous stones. The entrance to Whitewater is still carrying numerous puddles because it's not level. Um, it is, it's absolutely atrocious. It has not met residents' expectations, and we're horrified by the state that the road has been left in. We expect our roads to be done to an acceptable standard. And what happened in Whitewater falls way short of this expect expectation. What will the council do to remedy this matter as a matter of urgency? Plus, why was Cherry Orton Road resurfaced in a different but more acceptable manner? Thank you. Councillor Hiller, do you want to come back, please? Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you again, Mr. Chapman, for your follow-up question. Um, I'm not aware of the, the roads that you speak about, so I'm, you know, without physical um, knowledge and, and seeing sight of the treatment, I personally can't comment, but I would certainly get our uh, highways engineers to look at um, the, the issues you cite. Um, I, I'm, from a personal point of view, I'm very proud of our highway services, Mr. Chapman. The, professionalism and the dedication of our officer management team and the hardworking, highly skilled crews um, who are out there in all weathers, um, keeping our city's traffic flow to be one of the fastest commutes in the UK. Um, I would also add, Mr. Chapman, that you know what, what you're saying about our service that we provide, I, I don't recognize generally or, or even specifically. We, we are, in, in, in terms of national customer satisfaction scores, we year after year, we're ranked amongst the best in the UK, our highway service, and consistently annually ranked as the best highway service provider in the east of England. Um, it, it's not something I recognise, Mr Chapman, that's not to suggest it's not the case, of, of course it is, you're saying it is, so there must be an issue there. Um, I will get our highways engineers out to look at where you're, you're talking about, and we'll do that within the next couple of days. Thank you, Mr Chapman. Thank you, Answer Hedda. Question three from Miss Emery. Miss Aberkin, would you like to ask the question relating to Warrington playing field on behalf of Miss Emery? Yes, good attempt at my name. <laughs> Top marks for effort. <laughs> um, Ken Simpson School has several outdoor areas for sports and has used the public open space that surrounds the school for many many years without any issue as have lots of sports groups um, with young people. Um, the fence that proposed that is proposed isn't an Ofsted requirement and it hasn't been mentioned in the last couple of Ofsted reports for the school. Um, the risk assessment that 
kind of backs up the reasoning for the fence wasn't actually completed until after planning uh, application was submitted. And actually the risks identified in the risk assessment do very little or nothing um, to mitigate the risks that were identified. And that's not my view, that's according to the school's own commentary. Pupils will still use the area outside the fence. So the question is, why is safeguarding being given as the reason for the fence? And to be clear, we're not, um, this question isn't about challenging the planning uh, permission which has been given. It's, it's challenging the installation, which is still very much within uh, the hands of the council to decide whether or not to go ahead. Um, the council's basically given itself planning permission. It's, it's the council's land. You can choose not to go ahead with installation. Uh, will you take notice of these comments and the objections from Warrington residents? Um, just for context, there are over 1,200 people that have signed the petition against the installation of the fence. And we can verify the postcodes for 800 of them, which are Peterborough people. Um, 200 have signed an open letter giving their addresses in full and names, and 400 people have joined the Facebook group. So the question is, why is safeguarding being given as, as a, a reason for this fence? And can the council rethink the installation? Councillor Hiller, would you like to respond, please? Yes, I would, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Ms. Murray, for, for your um, question. Um, it, it's a little bit, I mean, we, we have a number of questioners around the same subject, who you'll, you'll be aware, I'm sure, as, as will members. It, it's not easy for me to answer any questions about children's safeguarding, I'm afraid. It's, it's not within my portfolio. And so it, I'm, I'm unable to answer the questions you asked specifically about child safeguarding. You, you say you have no issues with the planning process, which is pretty much where I come from. Um, and I was a member, you'll, you'll be aware, I know, because we, we've exchanged emails. Um, I was a member of the planning committee that sat, I think, on the 10th of March um, when we decided this, this application. So I'm, I'm sorry to say to you from a child protection point of view and, and whether or not the, the council as the landowner has the right or not has the right to, to go ahead with any insta installation in conjunction with the school because it was the school that made the application. You'll, you'll be aware of that. Um, and it was the headmaster, the principal of the school that was actually at the planning committee meeting um, arguing the case for committee members to, to approve. So it, it, that has to be my answer, I'm afraid. I, I can't answer your specific question. Um, if there's questions about the planning process, I'm, I'm more than happy and completely able to answer that. Um, my colleague, Councillor Ayres, is the education uh, cabinet member. You'll be aware of Councillor Ayres, I'm sure. I don't know whether Councillor Ayres wants to actually chip in with your particular question or not. Um, Lynn? Yes, yes, I, I, I can do. Uh, good evening. Um, I have looked into the safeguarding aspect from the point of view of the local authority, of course, um, because we are the people who are responsible as well for safeguarding and making sure that that is happening. And the council has been working in partnership with the school over several years to reduce safeguarding risks associated with the open nature of the site. Work has been undertaken which has successfully helped to mitigate the risks from the shared school vivacity use of sports facilities at the site. However, other significant safeguarding risks remain and these relate to the school's need for outdoor playing space, which is currently open access to anyone who wishes to access it at any time. As a consequence, the school hasn't been using the playing field for around 12 months, placing restrictions on children and young people's ability to benefit from a full range of outdoor sport activities. The installation of a fence was identified as a means of mitigating the safeguarding risk and supporting children's health and well-being. Because safeguarding of children and young people is one of the council's statutory responsibilities alongside its role as champion for all children. And schools are judged by the Office for Standards in Education, Ofsted, on safeguarding measures they have in place when they do their visits and their inspections. And any identified failings can lead to a school being identified as requiring special measures. So the focus rightly is on prevention and reduction of risk. As part of the planning application process, 
the interim safe, uh, education safeguarding lead for Peterborough was asked to consider the safeguarding concerns which had been raised by the head teacher and the proposal to install fencing as a means of mitigating these. Her assessment was that the installation of a fence would improve the school's ability to safeguard children and young people. And this was recorded in a letter, as I understand it, which was submitted as part of the planning application process and is therefore a matter of public record. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a follow up question, please? I do. Um, my follow up question, everything that Councillor Ayres um, said makes a lot of sense and it's very, very difficult to argue with the words child safeguarding as a parent, I know that. The, the real substantial part of my question is that by the school's own risk assessment, the risks, the major risks identified will not be solved by this fence. So I suppose everything you've said makes complete sense, except when you consider that. That's not really a question, is it? Well, no, I, I mean... If, if I might come back on that, Mr Mayor, um, you know, we, we, the council was presented with a planning application. Um, the planning application followed due process, um, you'll be aware. Um, there was representation from the ward councillors, um, there was representation from objectors, there was representation from the applicant um, in, in the form of the, of, of the school principal. Um, so as far as the council's procedural uh, methodology is concerned, um, it, it's, it, it's without question, um, you know, we've, we've done the right thing. So what you're asking though, quite rightly, I have to say quite rightly, um, what you're asking is whether or not the fence should be there or not, or if it should be in a different place or whatever. Um, I mean, I personally can't comment whether the council can exercise any any rights we, we you know, the council may or may not have uh, as landowners um, in that regard. I don't know whether uh, Councillor Ayers has, has got anything to add to that. And the, the only thing I probably can add is that there was a, a site visit there by our safeguarding lead um, in, in early January, very early January, and as part of that site visit, um, the changes were reviewed and the proposal to have um, the um, fence put up. And that was the basis upon which her later assessment, which went forward into the planning application, um, was made. Um, apart from that, I, I, I can't add anything on behalf of the local authority because, as Councillor Hiller has said, of course, the application was made by the school itself quite properly. Thank you. Question four from Ms. Green. Ms. Green, would you like to ask your question relating to Warrington playing field? Yes, thank you. Um, obviously, following on from what was spoken about earlier, um, this area was a dual use area for um, residents of Warrington and with the school as well. Um, what you're proposing is a single use for the school of a vast area of fields that is used daily by many different people, um, walkers, joggers, uh, children playing, etc. Um, the proposal for such a vast area to be fenced off with a fence that is considerably high and not pleasant looking takes away so much of this field. Um, I myself, I'm a parent, have three children that went through Ken Simpson School. They all um, were allowed to play out at lunchtime, break time on the fields. Uh, they also had their PE out there. Um, it wasn't an issue. I do appreciate in this day and age that we all need to safeguard our children. And I feel that the amount of space that they are planning to take is vast. Um, I can appreciate that they would like an open area for some sports. Um, one football pitch size, I think, would be more than adequate. They have many other facilities to use in school. Um, they have hard play area already. 
Um, they have AstroTurfs, tennis courts, a hard play area. They have a gym that is now not used by the public during school time. Um, they have many facilities for PE. It's not all to go outside. So therefore, I don't see why they need so much space. Councillor Hiller, would you like to respond, please? Councillor Hiller. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Ms. Green, for, for, for your question. Um, as I've said before, and, and at risk of repeating myself, um, from a planning perspective, um, we were presented as a planning committee, we were presented with um, an application um, and it went through due process according to um, how we do these things and, and a decision was made. I, I think a, a couple of comments you made about the the use of the land and, and quite emotive terms, absolutely, I'm, and I can understand your, your passion about this subject, but under the terms of the consent that we did give as a, as a, a planning committee, uh, a community use agreement um, must be entered into by the applicant. Um, and whilst that's not finalised, I understand, um, I also understand it's currently proposed that the pitch or pitches can be booked for formal use by the public outside school times. Um, and as with any formal pitch operated by the council, um, the area will be freely available uh, for casual use outside of school time. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure how that, it seems to be contradictory to, to what you're saying. Um, perhaps you, you'd expand on that with any follow-up answer. I don't know whether Councillor Ayers wants to add anything to that. I, I, I don't think I can, except but I, I do agree with, with them, um, the, um, this, per this person who's made, giving the answer, Frances Green, I do agree with her, that, that of course the present day safeguarding is very different to how it was when that school was developed in the first instance, which is back in the, I think the early eighties or something of that order. Um, and of course, safeguarding now is a, is a very, very important aspect of every single school and indeed, uh, on behalf of the council as well. Thank you. Miss Green, do you have a follow-up question? Um, just a comment really, um, obviously that it says it's, that it will be available to walk around or to use freely out of school time, um, but who particularly is going to want to walk around a fenced off area? Um, I, not me. Um, just another query as well, you know, if you fence this area off, um, what guarantees do we have that that area will then not be built on by the school in future? And also what guarantees do we have that if this is allowed this amount of land, are they then in a few more years time going to ask for more land um, under the guise of, of safeguarding? Thank you. Councillor Hiller, do you want to come back? Councillor Hiller. Uh, yes, um, I'll come back factually, um, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you again, Ms. Green, for, for, for the follow-up. What I would say to you is, is the land is retained in council ownership, and, and I might add that any potential future use of that land, for whatever reason, would need a planning consent. So it, it's not going to slip under the door um, or be... Um, uh, you know, land grab, I think was an emotive term that somebody else has used, um, unless we, we, we know about it and it has to follow due process again. So I, I hope that reassures you to a degree. Thank you. Question five from Mr. Dalton. Mr. Dalton, would you like to ask you a question related to open fields? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, please, can you answer why when the Peterborough Development Corporation specifically designed the green open fields and recreation facilities for the benefit of the local community and residents, that permission can be granted without consultation of most of the people who live and enjoy the scenery of the area. For instance, not a single household in Cannonsville, Wainwright or Cranmore has been consulted. They live within 150 yards of the work and use the area, area constantly. A majority of the households written 
two are over a half a mile away and they are basically in old Warrington not new Warrington no notices were visible during the application period and this really disenfranchises the local population furthermore the construction will be used for a minimal amount of time in each year by school pupils I estimate about nine percent of the maximum time there has never been any threatening incidents in the past 18 years. The headmaster claims he is safeguarding the students, and I understand these points uh, from potential flats, uh, threats, and yet he allows students to spend their breaks unsupervised in the Warrington Centre. There may well be a letter from parents giving permission for the young people to be allowed outside, but the headmaster cannot abdicate his responsibility in this case. If those same parents wrote and gave permission for their child to play Xbox instead of attending lessons, he presumably wouldn't allow it. It seems like one side of the school premises is a draconian fence and the other is a free for all in Warrington Centre. There's no consistency here. In any event, I believe that an eight foot fence is not the solution to the issue you don't need an eight foot fence to stop a dog pooing when a three foot hedge would suffice um, furthermore if a gunman or someone else wished to harm the students by some means then they can shoot a gun through a mesh fence indeed i think the fence achieves the opposite of what they're trying to do its very design keeps people out but it also keeps the students locked in. It corrals them and they are just sitting ducks if that eventually happened. They are cornered with no means of escape by people who want to harm them because of an eight foot fence. I would also ask, what does this teach our young people growing up? You need to be imprisoned to protect you from other human beings. We're all going through some form of isolation and imprisonment now let's not impose more on our young people i would ask the council members if they agree that it's worth just pausing this project and sort of considering alternatives thank you thank you mr dalton councillor hiller would you like to respond please yes I'm, i'd i'd be happy to respond in in general terms mr mayor and, and thank you mr dalton for your lengthy um um, question, but um, there were myriad points that you made there, Mr. Dalton, um, regarding children being assassinated and, and dogs pooing, and, and that's you know th those aren't planning issues for, from our point of view. Um, it does, however, give me the opportunity, I think, to just outline um, the planning procedure. And you, you mentioned consultation, Mr. Dalton, and I think that's very re relevant. Um, the publicity for this application. Uh, was, were site notices. There were site notices, uh, Mr. Dalton. Will you shake your head? But there were site notices because I've been told there were site notices and members of the public have seen site notices. So the fact that you didn't was um, you're not seeing them and, and other people did. There were press, there was a press notice, uh, neighbor notification letters to properties that, that site, um, which you, you touched on. Uh, all, I have to say, all in accordance with the requirements of current planning legislation. Uh, Warrington Neighbourhood Council was also consulted on the application, as were, of course, the ward council, as you'll, you'll be aware. Um, whilst the Neighbourhood Council didn't object uh, to the proposals, the officer's report to the committee cited that they had a, a number of comments, um, and, and those comments were reported to the committee. Um, the report presented to the planning committee also stated there were nearly 200 initial consultations and that 79 representations were received, 49, sorry, 45 in support, and 39 were objecting. Um, these are the facts uh, as, as we were presented. Uh, Recognising the, the local interest, the application was duly called in um, by Councillor John Fox. And so the application was considered by the planning committee, as I said to a previous questioner on the, on the 10th of March this year, uh, councillors Mr. and Mrs. Fox both addressed the committee, as did two objectors, and so did the applicant, um, the school principal, Mr. Brian Irwin. Um, after careful consideration of the officer's report, the points raised by the ward councillors, objectors, and the applicant, uh, 
uh, committee, after debate, resolved to approve the application by a majority of vote of seven to four members. Um, there's very little else I can say. I mean, we, we debated the issue. I must stress that the correct planning policy procedure has been followed. The committee was properly chaired and, and held in the presence of the council's legal officer and open to any member of the public who, who wished to observe proceedings. Um, I think it also might be relevant to mention that in matters like these, um, Mr. Dalton, um, the, the planning process pertains, pertains to consents and refusals of application. It, it doesn't pertain to land ownership. Um, the, the land ownership is, is a completely separate legal matter. Um, I hope that covers a lot of your points, Mr. Dalton. I am certainly haven't covered all of them, um, but I hope that covers the majority of them. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Excuse me for interrupting, Mr. Mayor, but we have reached our 30 minute time limit for public questions. Um, so we'll have to move on to the next item. Um, but the questions from Ms. Hudgens and Mr. Hall will be responded to in writing and those answers published within the minutes of the meeting. Agenda item seven petition. I will now hand over to monitoring officer to run through the standing order around petitions. Apologies, Mr. Mayor. Um, may I remind you that in accordance with the Council's rules of procedure, anyone presenting a petition will have one minute to introduce their petition however they see fit. We will not be making any determination as to the validity of any petitions this evening, simply receiving petitions for validation by officers in due course. There is one petition this evening from the public. Mr. Hasib, please could you present your petition to members? You have one minute. I think Mr. Hasib might have left the meeting, Mr. Mayor, so we might have to move on from that one. Are there any petitions from members this evening? Yes, I have uh, Councillor Ali here. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Would you like to say what it is, please? Uh, sorry, I just... Uh... Yes, I have been uh, emailed a petition from uh, residents in Millfield uh, 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 raising concerns about uh, a large number of licensed premises in a densely populated area from uh, Tavernus Road to the Triangle. Uh, they feel let down. These uh, licensed prominence premises are causing antisocial behavior and crime and they would like the council to take some firm action to improve the area. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other petitions from members? Fiona, um, if I could just, I've just got to give councillor uh, Mr. Hasib a call and see if he can rejoin the meeting. So I'll let you know when we've done that. No other hands raised, Fiona. The Pippa, do you want us to wait for that to happen? Um, yes, if you could just give me two seconds. Two, two minutes then, please, members.
Apologies, Fiona and members. Um, I've not been able to get hold of Mr. Hasib, so I think we should probably move on. Pippa, <laughs> I've just had a call from Mr. Hasib, and he's saying he's been removed from the meeting, and that's why he can't rejoin. Um, can I, I don't know whether we can suggest if anyone's able to contact Mr. Hibsteeb that they can present his petition on his behalf. If you give me 30 seconds, I'll, because we're based in the same office, oh. I'll, I'll go and find him. Thank Back you. In 30 seconds. Hi there. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. My name is Mohamed Asib. I am a Mil Milfield businessman in Northwood. I have been requested by residents to pre uh, present this petition. Uh, the residents of Milfield feel extremely concerned, frustrated and let down by the authorities as our neighbor neighborhood has been neglected for the past two decades with rising crime, antisocial behavior, fly tipping, litter and the rise in HMOs. We are demanding firm sustainable action to address the decline in our already densely populated neighborhood with more visible presence from the authorities and stricter action against unlicensed HMOs. We would like the installation of CCTV in the Southern Street area, which is one of the current hotspots. Residents have been raising concern over several years with the council, but they feel they have fallen on deaf ears. We have seen all the council efforts centered on the city center, while other areas and Millfield in particular have been forgotten and underinvested. I hope the council will address these long outstanding and growing issues. The residents and the business are feeling frustrated and let down. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think you can move on to agenda item eight. Thank you. Agenda item A, 8A and B and C, question or notice. This relates to question to the, to the mayor and the leader of member of the cabinet or the chair of any committee or subcommittee I have allocated the question to the most relevant member to respond. Please note that any question relating to ward issues will be answered in writing only. These answers can be found in the question report within the additional information pack. The item limit for this item is 30 minutes. Question will be taken as read, unless there is an objection to this. There have been 16 questions submitted by members this evening. Question one from Councillor Fowler. Councillor Fitzgerald, would you like to respond to the... Yes, I would, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, members, and whoever's watching in the wild world there. Um, Councillor Fowler, thank you for your question. So we have currently several testing sites for COVID-19 in Peterborough. And when selecting the sites, there is a balance between finding sites that meet the Department of Health and Social Care criteria, as well as looking at local COVID-19 rates and giving geographical coverage across the city. It's not possible to have them everywhere, of course, that just would not be feasible. But people now are also able to book postal kits for home testing by internet and phone, and we are looking at how we can support people who find this more difficult. Thank you very much. Councillor Fowler, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, it's only, it's only a quick one. Um, thank you very much for the response, Councillor Fitzgerald. Uh, I just wondered if you could uh, well, seek some clarity in regards to what is the criteria that you just mentioned, and would you be willing to look to reassess the possibility of having such a service at the said centre? Thank you. Um, I'm happy to take advice from our Director of Public Health 
on that criteria and I'm sure she will happily circulate it to you and other members. Uh, we don't set the criteria uh, as, as mentioned in my reply to you, it's a national criteria. In terms of uh, the centre that you refer to in particular, I think again, Councillor Farrow, it's down to uh, need demographics and geo geographical coverage uh, across the city. It's got to go somewhere and we can't place them everywhere. You, you will also know that we've had various testing centres across the city and that remains the case today. But I'll have Dr. Robin uh, circulate um, the uh, um, advice that meets the Department of Health and Social Care uh, criteria. Thank you very much. Question two from Councillor Sanford. Councillor Fergera, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Sanford in relation to the letter to local MP? I'm surprised in part that we got this letter because Councillor Sanford should know that the letters were sent to the MPs because a copy was sent to him um, at the time. So I'm told, of course, I'm happy to be corrected, uh, but the, for members' sake, the Director of Public Health has confirmed that a letter was sent to both MPs to make them aware of the council motion. Um, and uh, we haven't had a written reply, but we didn't, we didn't ask for a written reply to be perfectly truthful. But I have had replies from uh, both Shailish Vara and Paul Bristow. So on Shailish Vara's part, um, he has conveyed the views of the council as included within the correspondence from Dr. Robin's office. And uh, he sent that onto the cabinet office and awaits a response from them. Those eagle-eyed amongst you or that pay attention to the parliament channel, like some of us might do on here, will know that Paul Bristow MP for Peterborough has been very vocal about standing up for Peterborough on all sorts of matters. And it's no different here. So if you were to check Hansard, uh, you will recall that he recently said in the house, Peterborough has done the right thing and we do not want to be in tier two and I want the minister to hear this very clearly. We do not want to be in tier two and we will do everything to present this. So he's very aware uh, about the good work that the council's public health team are doing, supported by all our enforcement team that are at work in the community on a daily basis uh, that took us out of the government's watch list and has managed so far, let's touch wood, uh, to keep a lid on the numbers. Uh, you will note that where we are in the country is nowhere near some of the areas like in Yorkshire and Humber and Teesside, Manchester and Liverpool. We are, you know, doing very well and I'd like it to remain so. So all our teams working hard should be applauded for all that great work going on and both MPs are aware of that too. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Constance Sanford, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Matt. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet member for that response. Um, we keep hearing from um, council leaders across the country that they aren't being properly consulted before local lockdown measures are concerned. So it, it's really good to hear that our MPs are making that case in Parliament. Having a more localised approach is even more necessary for contact tracing. The contact tracing done by our team here in Peterborough is delivering a 92% success rate, but they only get leads passed on to them um, about three days after the national service has trialled and has tried and failed to actually make contact with people. So could the cabinet member find ways of pressing the government to devolve contact tracing more entirely to councils and also to give us the resources that are needed? Thank you, Councillor Sanford. Again, I will ask Dr. Robin, because uh, I'm not going to take the stats you gave there at face value. What I would agree with you is that we in Peterborough are more successful than the national testing service. As to how long we get them, um, I don't know if it is three days. Liz might be able to nod and tell me it could be quicker, it could be longer, uh, but um, I don't think that's true. Uh, I'm getting I'm getting a nod that that's not entirely accurate. So in terms of, yes, we're always happy to step up and assist government. And in fact, government themselves through the cabinet office have 
you know, praised Peterborough. They came and did a visit uh, some time ago now, although it's only weeks, but it seems a lifetime ago, and said what a good job we were doing. So I think they have trusted us so far to uh, manage in a devolved way um, the response to COVID-19, not just in Peterborough, but in the wider sense across the county, because we are one public health team. So I'm sure Dr. Robin will uh, press the necessary people if she feels that more needs to be done. And that is the case, but I think we're well on top of it. Uh, I'll ask her to convey or correct uh, or confirm the stats, uh, Councillor Sanford, and share that with all members as to what our you know, position is in terms of the number of days, etc. But all I can say again is we are doing a very good job and it's a well done to all the public health team and all the other officers that have been seconded to work in terms of um, enforcement and prevention and advice uh, during this COVID crisis. Thank you, Ben. Uh, question three from Councillor Wigan. Councillor Holdridge, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Wigan in relation to the new town fund? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wigan, for your counsel and for your question. The council is still waiting to hear the outcome of the town's fund bid that was submitted at the end of July. The town's fund, on behalf of the city council, you recall, is one of the first cities prepared and submitted an investment plan, investment plan. I'm not in a position yet to reveal that what allocations are from the plan, but I'm sure through the Townsman Board that it will be made known soon, as, as, as told by the government. The council will recall they did receive one million pounds of accelerated Townsman Award at the end of September. This fund is allocated and is expected to be spent as follows. Central, central 34%, Breton 14%, across the city uh, 14%, East 10%, North 9%, Orton, Long, Orton Waterville 5%, Paston and Walton 5%, Breton and Woodston 2%, West 2, Warrington 1. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Holrich. Councillor Wigan, do you have a follow up question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Holditch, for uh, the answer to my question. Um, would like to say um, well done to um, to our great team at the City Council for securing that funding and getting the bids in. It's good news that we're um, ahead of the of the trend. Um, however, it's noticeable noticeable from that list that there are parts of the city that have been missed out. Um, there are the new the town's fund is part of the government's agenda to level up, but in order to level up, we need to level up our city as well. Um, there's lots of people at the moment who don't want to be in the city centre because they're worried about COVID. That may change going forward. It may not. We don't know. Um, but there are areas such as uh, Hampton, uh, Fletton, High Street, not on the list. Big. Uh, district centres that are important to the way our city is built and the way we city has come to be through the development corporation as we were an original new town. Um, what plans does the city council have to level up areas of our city? Council Holdridge, do you want to come back? Thank you, Councillor Wiggins. Uh, the Fletton and Woodson are getting uh, money out of this, but you know one has to follow the rules of the bid. And as far as levelling up concerned, and uh, you know what is improvements to the city do benefit the whole city. And in this case, on the uh, open spaces uh, uh, issue, it was done on a more scientific basis because it was based on a, an audit of all our facilities done in 2018 of those most in need. And this, 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 that list reflects the audit that was done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question, question four from Councillor Barkham. Uh, Councillor Celesti, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Barkham in relation to Little Bin location? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, of course. Um, well, Aragon, Aragon Direct Services are currently in the process of GIS mapping. And they intend to map all the litter bins across the city once this is complete. 
Um, we will be able to show councillors this information. I'm happy to share it. And um, we will have details for their individual wards. Um, we currently have circa 1,600 litter bins across the whole of Peterborough. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Barkham, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just to clarify, presently, we don't know the exact locations of the bins that we own. Is that correct? I don't know that that is correct. I, I, I would say that it's not held in one, all that information is not held in one repository. But I would imagine, and I'm pretty sure, that the individual teams that look after certain areas will know exactly where everything is. Thank you. Question five from Councillor Day. Councillor Hiller, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Day in relation to the new planning white paper? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor, I have some uh, internet problems. Uh, can, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify that, thank you. Um, thank you for the question, um, Councillor Day. Um, it's an interesting question, of course, very topical. Um, there are, as you'll be aware, two government consultation documents. Um, they're substantial and they do in themselves propose wide ranging changes to the current planning system. So I have to say to you, Councillor Day, it would take a fair bit of time to, to overview the proposals comprehensively this evening within the context of this questions to cabinet um, element of our, of our meeting. Um, I think it's also worth stating that the First of these initiatives has just finished its consultation period and the other is still out for consultation until the end of the month. So um, the devil is always in the detail, Councillor Day, you'll be aware. Um, and, and what's being proposed now might not actually be um, legislated without some changes after the consultation process. So um, I'd be happy, more than happy, to provide a written response regarding the effect of any planning changes to this authority, um, but only, I think, sensibly, uh, until the, the, uh, the proposals are in some form of representative policy. I, I hope that would satisfy you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. May. Thank you. Councillor Day, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to make a couple of points and raise a question. Um, <clears throat> in, under the changes to the current planning system white paper, um, affordability is not given appropriate weighting using the standard method as it sees growth more for least affordable areas and it directs growth to the more affordable areas. So for Peterborough, a near 40% increase, that's 1,300 houses, are proposed to be built a year under these proposals. Um, that is, we've only achieved that once in the last 20 years in Peterborough. So if these do go through, and I have heard that the tone of the doc, I've read the document, the tone of the document is this will happen. And once it's passed through, it will happen quickly. Though that uh, level of building will prove difficult. Also with the uh, raising the affordable housing threshold to 40 to 50 dwellings will have significant impacts on the council's ability to deliver affordable housing. It will, it will also impact affordable housing in rural areas. And with the permission in principle proposals, this will result in reduced requirements placed on developers, reduced control at local level in decision making and financial implications for Peterborough City Council because there will be reduced planning fees for developers. Some of us uh, are calling this the builder's charter. Um, so my question is, how are these proposals compatible with the environmental bill and environmental law? And how will the reduced control of, of local levels in decision making affect our local plan? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hiller, do you want to come back? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Barron. Thank you for the follow-up um, questions and, and points of interest that you mentioned, Councillor Day. Um, I've been uh, actively involved with the Council's response to both of these uh, planning initiatives. And I would repeat, um, they are out to consultation, or one is still out to consultation, one's just finished. So as I said to you before, the, the devil is in the detail. So I think to predict what actually may be legislated for, I think wouldn't probably be particularly sensible at this point in time, until such time as government has firmed up with the proposals against, I have to say, um, you know, a, a, a fair degree of opposition. You, you mentioned the um, housing um, test increase based on an algorithm. Um, I personally don't think that's viable. 
um, we are a particularly high performing local planning authority um, we're building more houses than we are targeted for currently um, to increase that by something approaching 40 percent is is bonkers in my opinion but that's what we are up against currently um, i can't really comment on any of the points you make until i know exactly what's being um, legislated for but I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I'm, I don't think we're disagreeing. Um, the affordability level uh, from 40 to 50, of course, that is a deep concern to myself and, and, and a number of other people. But we have made um, very good representations. Um, MPs, uh, my own MP, Shailesh Vara, um, is particularly um, anxious uh, that government listen to what it is we're saying. And what we are saying is based on sound common sense. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hida. Councillor Howell, uh, qu sorry, question six from Councillor Howell. Councillor Allen, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Howell in the relation to the Im embankment athletics arena? Yes, indeed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Howell, for your question uh, regarding the transformation and the future of the uh, embankment. Um, the council, let me reassure you, recognises the significance of the athletics track in Peterborough, which provides important facilities for many individuals, clubs and societies, helps tackle some of the health and well-being challenges in our city and grows local talent. Uh, we are fully committed to ensuring the track continues to be a feature in our city <clears throat> and be assured we're in active discussions with local athletics club and service users about arrangements that will help achieve this. With regard to the embankment overall, excellent progress is being made with the University Phase 1 scheme, which will uh, be on site in early 2021, and also with plans for the, uh, an associated innovation hub that will quickly follow as Phase 2. We are fully committed to deliver the uh, later phases of the university, working with ARU and uh, CPCA, um, Angular Rusty University and the Combined Authority, uh, how and uh, where the exact that how exactly that comes forward will depend on the outcome of the uh, current embankment master planning work that the council is uh, working on uh, with CPA and uh, Peter United. Uh, the master plan will provide an important framework for a potential new stadium in, uh, in the embankment area that Peter United are leading the case for. Um, any ideas uh, that. Uh, uh, proposals to change the current provision of activities will be subject to the uh, full discussion and consultation as it would be for uh, any new use across the embankment area, which uh, I would reiterate we recognise is hugely val valuable and is currently perhaps underused asset for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, do you have any follow-up question, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I do. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Allen. Um, the Peterborough um, Neen Valley Athletics Club has around 400 members, many of whom use it to compete and train. Uh, bearing in mind what you've said, um, are there any plans to enhance existing spectator facilities? Currently, there's no grandstand, which prevents certain events from being staged there. Uh, that's a good proposal to put forward. As I said earlier, we are in consultation, uh, active discussions with the local athletics club uh, with a view to them being much more involved in that facility. And indeed, we're talking to other service users. I believe that you want it to be improved. And I agree with you. We should uh, really make sure that that particular facility is used to good purpose. And I appreciate your question and enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Alan. We go question seven from Councillor John Fox. Councillor Hiller, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor John Fox in relation to the consultation uh, area for planning applications? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd be more than happy to. And I thank uh, Councillor Fox for his question. I, th I think uh, uh, I understand the sentiment behind uh, Councillor Fox's question, Mr. Mayor, appertaining as I, as I imagine it does, um, certainly from the last questions we've had from the public, to the fencing issue within his Warrington ward and his effort at the planning committee meeting in March. Um, whilst there's nothing preventing ward councillors or indeed neighbourhood councils or anyone come to that, uh, mounting an awareness campaign 
for an application they deem contentious, uh, the requirements regarding the publicity of planning and associated applications is set by the government's planning legislation and operated under the council's adopted statement of community involvement. Um, whilst I can see why a dedicated and conscientious ward members uh, like Councillor Fox may wish to see the extent of publicity expand for certain applications, Mr. Mayor, it's a risk, and, and I say it's a very real risk that this could lead to a delay in the determination of some planning applications at a time when government is keeping a, a very close eye on the performance of planning authorities. Um, additionally, it could also result in an inconsistent approach to the publicity for applications. You, you'll appreciate, I'm sure, as what one person may view as a controversial proposal uh, and may another may not be as exercised. Um, with regard to the numbers of residents who object to any particular application, I think it's also worthwhile to mention generally, uh, Councillor Fox and Mr Mayor, um, that Peterborough is a plan-led authority um, and planning applications are required in law to be decided in accordance with the adopted local plan policy unless any material planning considerations outweigh it. Um, in this regard, I think it's important to say that the sheer number of objections to a planning application is not essentially material. Um, it's the substance of those objections um, that's important. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I hope that's answered your question, Councillor Fox. Thank you. Councillor John Fox, do you have a follow-up question? No, I don't, Mr. Mayor. I just thank you for his precise and definite uh, reply. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Question eight from Councillor Shaz Nawaz. Councillor Seaton, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Shaz Nawaz in relation to sustain sustainable budget? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Nawaz, for your question. Um, <clears throat> in answer to it, we, we really need to look at the situation pre and post COVID. Pre COVID, we had a budget deficit of 14 million pounds from 2021, 22 onwards. We'd actually identified nearly 12 million pounds of ongoing savings to close that gap with a year to address the main remaining 2 million. And uh, I was confident at the start of the year that over the 12 months we'd moved to a sustainable budget. COVID has clearly changed that situation. I think a BBC survey uh, in June suggested 158 out of 173 councils who responded had a problem this year. Other data actually supports that. Thankfully, we still have a balanced position. So far, we've received something like 28 million of additional government funding. I expect more and indeed, Another national £1 billion tranche was announced on the 12th of October. I hope for good news on that soon. However, like nearly all councils, we have a considerable challenge next year. It's almost impossible to predict the course of this pandemic, the timing of economic recovery, um, potential vaccines, income lost, and the further expenditure needed to support work with our communities. Hence, you know, we can only use our best endeavours to estimate the gap to a sustainable budget in coming years. Phase one of the medium term financial strategy, which we launched for consultation on the 16th of October, gives that best estimate. The gap is currently due to the COVID-19 emergency and is why we've approached MHCLG with a range of short and medium term one off and continuing options. They have said they recognise that even with the considerable support already provided, there will be individual authorities with unique circumstances, which is why they're encouraging councils to approach them to discuss the future financial position. I'm grateful they'll continue to work closely with us as this council supports our community through the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Seaton. Councillor Shaz Nawaz, do you have a follow-up question? I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Seaton, for your comprehensive uh, answer. I'm sure you'd agree that uh, we were in quite a bit of trouble even before COVID. 
uh, and also being a former banker, you'll also agree that it's wise to learn from the past. So on reflection, looking back, what do you think the council could have done better so that perhaps today we'd have been in a much better position? And I asked that question really, Councillor Seaton, just to understand how we could move forward so that we don't repeat the shortcomings of the past. Councillor Seaton, do you want to come back? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So there's a couple of points there, Councillor Wales. The first, you say we were in quite a bit of trouble. I, I've just said that we had a gap of 14 million pounds and we had a year to find the remaining two million. So I would not agree with you on that. I think we were in a very good position to get to a sustainable situation. You know, I, yes, I'm a banker, you're an accountant, we're numbers people, you're an expert in tax avoidance, maybe I should have listened to you a bit more. Um, but I don't think that given the problem we've currently got is due to the pandemic, it serves any purpose to look back over the recent years and say, we should have done things differently. We were in a good position at the start of this year. The pandemic has changed everything and it has changed that for every single council in this country. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Seaton. Question nine from Councillor Hogg. Councillor Sasti, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Hogg in relation to fly tipping? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the question, Councillor Hogg. Um, an update report on this very subject has been recently produced at the request of the Growth, Environment and Resources Scrutiny Committee. We will, of course, be circulating to members of that committee and anyone else who wants it, really. And I would be happy to send you a, a personal copy to you, Councillor Hogg, if you so wish, uh, to, to, to summarise, if I may, Scrap it, fly, the scrap, scrap it fly tipping campaign in conjunction with the sea recycling for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough recap partnership, of which I, Peterborough is a member, continues to work on sharing intelligence and best practice in the fight against fly tipping, which we all agree is a despicable thing to do. The COVID-19 situation has curtailed much of the practical, practical aspect of the project and however, the project is continuing to deliver and move forward. The pest service continues where possible to investigate incidents of fly tipping and have issued over 80 uh, FPNs since April this year. They have also supported the installation of physical me measures in some locations where necessary to limit fly tipping where possible. Following the reopening of the Fengate HRC, close temporarily to comply with the essential travel requirements arising from the March 2020 down lockdown measures, fly tipping has not materially reduced as one might have expected it to do. The separately identified measures which require business cases to be developed in order to support new unplanned funding remained, remain paused during the unprecedented financial situation the council is in. However, they will of course be kept under review through the budget setting process. Thank you, Councillor Hogg. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, sorry to interrupt, but we have again reached our 30 minute time limit. Um, so all remaining questions will be answered in writing and included within the minutes of the meeting. So we now need to move to questions on notice relating to the combined authority. Thank you. Agenda item 9D, question on notice. This relates, this relates to question to the combined authority representatives. The time limit for this item is 15 minutes. One question has been submitted this evening. Question, question one from Councillor Sanford. 
Councilor Holdridge, would you like to respond to the question from Councilor Sanford in relation to CAM Metro system? Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Sanford. Uh, this is a very long answer. There is a short answer, which I'll give you at the end. CAM is one of the key priorities of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough combined authority. And it's at the centre of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough local transport plan. It is the key to levelling up the CPCA area, ensuring that all parts of the CPCA can enjoy the growth experience in recent years by both Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. It will, it will, it will do this, connecting key employment sites to affordable quality homes and a company that be set up to promote the CAM and oversee its delivery. And Lord Mayor has been and that's spelled M-A-I-R, was uh, appointed as the chair of the company from the 1st of October. Lord Mayor, who is a genealogy engineer with so many names after his, uh, letters after his name, it's not true. And uh, Sir Kirby Lang, Professor of Civil Engineering and Director of Research at the University of Cambridge, is leading the ex leading expert on tunnelling and in 2014 was elected as Vice President of the Institution of Civil Engineers and on the 1st of November 1917, 2017 became the Institute's President of 1718 it's on his 200th anniversary year. He was appointed as an independent crossbencher in the House of Lords in 2015 and is currently a member of the Select Committee. Work is currently ongoing to develop the delivery strategy for the CAM programme with a view of creating a single one CAM programme for delivery on this important project. Whilst the one CAM programme is, is in development, it is too early to commit any dates for delivery, but work is expected to begin shortly along the GCP routes into Cambridge. There is certainly about, uh, certainly about the benefits of the network to Peterborough and Cambridgeshire. The CAM will include central tunnel section in Cambridge, the new garden communities uh, contributing to the cost of the infrastructure and the zero carbon autonomous smart mass transport system with regional routes intended to be part of the regional wide network linking quality housing to good jobs. The mayor recognises the importance that uh, I have placed upon the CAMS route linking Peterborough with the wider region uh, and also the opportunity it brings to create ma rapid mass transport system within Peterborough in due course. This all begins once the CAM company starts its work and completing the outstanding business case. The short answer I'll give you <laughs> is that uh, uh, Charlotte Palmer and myself had a telephone conference with the mayor some three or four weeks ago uh, because we want to progress the business case for the uh, rapid transport system in Peterborough uh, and the mayor expressed the wish that it should link up with, with, with the CAM. So we are looking at uh, delivering the one for Peterborough, but also links up uh, uh, with, with, with the CAM. But obviously, the, the CAM version is a few years away. Thank you. I hope that is a comprehensive answer. Uh, and if you've got any more, I will have to try and answer it. Councillor Sanford, do you have a follow up question? No, Mr. Mayor, I think that's a really comprehensive answer. Um, just whilst I'm talking, though, I am I am conscious of the fact that the meet we're now halfway through the meeting and we've only got through the first few items. So um, I, I have given you notice of the fact that I wish to move a procedural motion at this point um, in line with st um, standing order tw 20.1. It, it, which is to suspend the temporary um, um, standing order arrangement in the virtual meeting protocol, which restricts the meeting to three hours. And, and I would like to propose that it be extended back to its traditional length, which is um, four hours. So I would, I would like to propose that, please. Mr. Mayor, I think you need to ask if Councillor Sandford has a seconder. Conscious. He yeah. does, uh, Councillor Mayor, and I would like to second that. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Councillor Sheldon, 
will you second the motion or speak now or reserve your right to speak? I will second the motion, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I will not. I will hand over to Rachel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In the interests of time, the Mayor would like to keep debate on this item brief. If members have any key points to make, please can you raise your virtual blue hand now? Councillor Seaton. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my understanding is that for health and safety reasons, we should limit conference calls to something like two hours. We're already on for three hours. Perhaps we could be given some advice on that. A four hour conference call is a very, very long uh, thing to be involved with. Uh, Mr. Mayor, do you want me to answer that? Uh, Councillor Seaton, I think whenever we were discussing this at group leaders, the, the protocol, that, that advice was given that two hours was the optimum time for um, a virtual meeting. However, it is a matter for council to set its own times, nevertheless. Thanks, Fiona. Um, Councillor Holditch? Yes, leaders are aware that uh, I have opposed this at, at, at the leaders' meeting. I think there's plenty of time to conduct uh, the proper business of this uh, council within three hours. In fact, if, if everybody was to uh, behave themselves and stop the power of order, well, I reckon we could do it in two. The last meeting, I, I estimate that uh, about three quarters of an hour was taken up with, with arguing about procedure. So, personally, I would oppose going to four hours. Thank you. Councillor Chris Ash? Please. Thank you. Um, just a, a, a brief comment. Um, well, I think I, I, I agree with the Assembly Council speaking. Um, I think we do need to discuss business thoroughly. Um, I, I really three hours um, would be generally insufficient. Um, and if a meeting of three hours, is, over three hours is considered too long. Uh, I think the only answer is to have the meetings more frequently. Uh, and then that should organise it so that we can discuss uh, items within the three hours. It, it's quite a long agenda tonight. We've had a lot of questions. Um, if we're sticking to three hours, so we're going to be there. Uh, and I don't think that is uh, good for consultation or for democracy. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Hogg, please. Uh, so I just want to point out that uh, at the last meeting, uh, well, it was uh, truncated to three hours. We previously had an hours meeting, uh, which was a special meeting. So effectively, we had actually been sitting for four hours. So there was a, a precedent set there that we were in session for four hours albeit two separate meetings. Uh, I'd also like to point out the, um, the fact that even with four hours for a meeting, it is rare that we get through all of the order of business and that by truncating it by three hours, we effectively uh, say that we're not going to carry out all the business that's on the, on the, on the, on the paper. Um, and by truncating the meetings by three hours, uh, over four meetings, we effectively take out one meeting's worth of talking time for councillors to be able to discuss um, their democratic right or exercise their democratic right uh, to represent their, uh, their, their, their residents. Um, if we continue with three-hour meetings, we need to have more meetings. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, please. Thank you very much. And through you, Mr. Mayor, look, we, we should be able to manage these meetings uh, within the time given. We've also started uh, an hour earlier. I don't think the previous meeting was a whole hour. I can't remember. But anyway, so but there was a break between the meetings. If we didn't spend so long on political posturing on motions and the like, 
we'd get things done a lot quicker and the business of council would be heard and debated properly. We spend far too much time doing the other things, which really, if we want to have a separate meeting about motions, fine. But um, the fact is, let's do the business of the council. I'm not saying motions are important, but we just seem to be loading them in uh, for the sake of loading them in. We should have a sensible discussion amongst us all about what business we can sensibly get done and what motions we can debate in the time allowed rather than try and cram everything in because people have put far too much on the agenda. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jamil, please. Thank you. Um, I've got a slightly different tack. I'm not a big fan of four hour meetings, but I think one of the problems is that we don't actually meet often enough. Because we have less meetings, we then have more to fill in. Now, I've said this at scrutiny committees before as well, because when we're at scrutiny, you get items one and two, get a good hearing, and then three, four, and five, and just rush through. So I think the alternative may be, rather than going to four-hour meetings, is to have maybe one or two more meetings in the calendar year and make them sharper to, and stick them to three hours uh, rather than to cram everything in, it is difficult to get all the business done when you haven't met for two and a half, three months. So I'm a fan of having more meetings um, than going to four hours, but I will support this motion today. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Casey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I suppose I'm, as a musician, I'm acutely aware of um, wearing headphones for a long time. Unfortunately, the headphones that I spend the rest of the day wearing are a lot more comfortable than these. Um, and although the decibel level is quite low, um, they do start to hurt after a, after a few hours being worn others for a lot longer. I'd be interested to get a medical, a medical point of view on sort of um, the medical uh, damage that can be caused to hearing from long four hours. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Sanford? Yes, I, I was wanting to exercise my right to, to um, summate at the, the, the end of the debate. Yeah, so if it, yeah we've still got some, Oh, sorry. We've still got some speakers at the moment. I'll, I'll, um, Councillor Nawaz will then exercise his right, then I'll come back to you to sum up, Councillor Sanford. Councillor Coles? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have some concerns about the validity of a four-hour meeting. Um, I have a personal disability, which means sitting at a display screen for more than two hours is extremely uncomfortable. Um, I don't know if there are any others who have back complaints like mine. It's also contrary to the display screen equipment regulations, as we all know, that we're sitting too long at the screen anyway. I think it's really of no value to be sitting here at four hours when we should be discussing no more than three and ideally less than that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bisbee. Thank you. I get back to what Councillor David Seaton says and also Councillor Casey in that uh, people have jobs and because of COVID, many people are working from home uh, on these screens and DSE would say that we need to uh, not work as many hours. So I would be against this. Thank you. Councillor Howard. Good evening. Yeah, I think it'd be bad to go to four hours, not just for us with the screen time, but for the residents of the city who are watching it as well. Um, you know, we have to consider if they want to watch the debate for four hours. And I don't think we should reduce the amount of motions or the debate about them. Maybe it does need more meetings, but I believe three hours is enough for online. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have no more speakers. Um, therefore, Councillor Shaz Nawaz, would you like to exercise your right to speak, please? I would. Thank you very much, Rachel. I think it's, it's important to note that uh, full council is an opportunity for all councillors, especially those in our opposition, to obviously ask questions, to put forward motions on various different issues. Sometimes they could be political, but uh, as you'll see from later on this evening, uh, some of those motions are based on uh, certain areas which aren't just based on our political persuasion. But Councillor Seaton talks about uh, the, it's against health and safety or it breaks health and safety rules 
uh, if the meetings are longer than two hours. But if we're holding them for three hours, we're breaking those rules. So we shouldn't be breaking those rules. We should stick to meetings at two hours. Uh, so either we follow the rules or we don't. You can't have uh, both. Uh, and I think it's important and, and the public expect it that uh, we have the opportunity to hold uh, the administration to account. And I, I'm not saying they are saying we can't do that, but sometimes that takes time. Now, we, those who have been here longer than I have uh, will know quite often we kind of rush through those sometimes very important motions and we don't have the opportunity to debate them. Uh, and it's important we have that opportunity to debate motions. And uh, Councillor Coles, uh, I'm sorry to hear about your physical condition. What I would suggest is perhaps we have two hour meetings, but have, have them every single month uh, up until we can meet physically uh, in the chamber. That may then enable us to get through more business over those uh, months. Uh, Councillor Casey, uh, I'm sorry about your headphones. I think what you'll see is most people on this uh, call aren't using headphones. So if you want to speak to one of them uh, on how you can use different forms of technology, that that would be helpful. If not, I'm more than happy to give you some advice. I'm not the best guy, by the way, but I'm happy to give you advice. Uh, Councillor Coles, uh, you, you, you talk about value. That's very subjective in terms of what's valuable, what's not valuable. If you go into that debate, uh, we'll probably spend three hours talking about that. Uh, and Councillor Howard talks about it's bad for residents to be sitting down and watching this meeting. I mean, I have no idea how many people are actually sat down watching this live debate. Sorry, uh, Councillor uh, Nawaz. Uh, Councillor Casey has his hand raised. Okay. Do you have a so point of... I have a point of personal explanation. I think, unfortunately, the reason I have to wear these headphones is because of a Windows 10 up upgrade that completely wiped out the, the use of my sound card. So at the moment, I'm using this microphone, um, which with, head with these headphones logged into, which is a smaller jack, and I can't attach my more comfortable headphones onto this. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Casey. Thank you, Councillor Casey. That's why I prefer Apple to uh, Microsoft, but that's a very different question. So, Councillor Howard, I'm not too sure how many people are watching this uh, debate live, but the number is very, very low. So that's a, a something which we should be thinking about. How do we engage more, more residents? Uh, but residents have the opportunity, of course, to go back, back and watch this YouTube video later. We don't have that opportunity to come back later so I think extending the meeting to enable us to go through all the different and various motions uh, would be sensible. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Samford, would you like to sum up, please? Yes, I would. I'll try to do it briefly because I think Councillor Shaz and Nawaz has actually responded to a number of the points that were put forward. I think, you know, the view that myself and the Liberal Democrat group has on this is fairly straightforward. And I've articulated this a number of times at the group leaders meeting. And I think Councillor Hogg also referred to it. We either need to, to have a, a, a council meeting that is sufficient, that is of sufficient length in time to enable members to put motions forward and not just to have them have us take a vote on them but be able to put their opinions forward and for us to have a proper dis discussion of them now the fact is that even when we were having meetings that were four hours we were often not getting through half of the motions that have been put forward now you know th there's been some criticism raised oh there's too many motions well one of the reasons there were a lot of motions particularly at the july meeting was we hadn't had a council meeting for five months up to that point. Now, I know there were some reasons for, for that. You know, all of this talk, though, about, you know, health and safety regulations, what the health and safety regulations say is that you shouldn't have long, continuous periods of using a computer without having a break. Now, when Fiona was talking about the group leaders meeting, what she didn't mention was what we were talking about there. If we had a four hour meeting, we were going to have a half hour break in the middle of it so people would be able to, to have some rest 
and recuperation and have some food if they wanted to. You know, we really do need to have a means of enabling councillors to put their for that council meeting because that is the platform where that is supposed to happen and where the administration is supposed to be held to account. So, you know, I, I was going to move in, in another procedural motion. I'm not going to bother now because we will have a we'll have a long de debate on that. I, I also suggest that we could bring the, bring the motions forward on the agenda, you know, because um, Councillor Fitzgerald has very disparaging views of the, of the motions, but they are important and an important part of the business of, of the council. So I think we know we're going to lose this one, but it's really important that we actually um, give councillors a chance to ensure that they can put their opinions forward. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Uh, we will now move to the vote. Okay, are you okay, Pippa, for doing the vote? Yep, good. Councillors, we are now voting on whether to agree to suspend the interim standing orders arrangement that currently stipulates the meeting will end after three hours and extend this meeting to four hours. For, um, to vote, please press, although you already, already are doing, press the appropriate button for, against or abstain and then submit your... Um, votes, please. We still have a few councillors that haven't voted. Um, Rachel, I, 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 on mine, it just says yes or no. I press no. Is that right? Have you got my vote? Uh, Pippa, can you confirm? Um, it's not me doing the vote, it's Dan, but we can't, oh, we can't convert, confirm individual people's votes while the vote's live, I'm afraid. But if you've um, pressed the button, then that um, should have worked. I, I have some of Pippa. Mine is the same as the leader's. Um, I, I have... Raise hand, yes or no, and my choices. We still have six people, Rachel, who haven't voted. Okay. Well, tell us who haven't voted, then you can. One of them. Yeah, T take them verbally, Pippa. It's, it's so it's it's it shouldn't be a raised hand, yes or no. There should be a, a pop up screen on your screen that says one motion without notice, extend meeting of time, and then there should be an option for, against, or abstain. So if you I, don't, I don't have it on your screen, that's, if you don't have that, you can just raise your virtual hand and then we can see who hasn't got that. Okay, Councillor Hiller, which way will you be voting? Against. Thank you. Councillor Holditch? Against. So that would still leave four people, Rachel. Okay. That haven't voted. Okay, I'll give it a few more seconds. You could surely say who hasn't voted. No, the system only shows uh, the numbers in total. It won't have individual councillors. Okay, Mr Mayor, if I may, through you, could I also suggest then members who didn't see the four against or abstain window put their hands up? If you saw something else other than that, then you haven't voted. OK, no, I'm getting no more raised hands, so I'm going to close the vote. Thank you. Um, the result of the vote is 26 in favour, 28 against. There were no abstentions. Therefore, this motion is defeated. Thank you. Therefore, everybody must have voted. Councillor Sandford, do you wish to move your second motion without notice? Just want, can we just confirm? No, that, I don't wish to move it. I, I think 
that we'll just have a, a further long drawn out debate on that so it, it will be down to the productive so I, I won't move it Does that take another 20 time. minutes uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, you were due to adjourn the meeting at eight o'clock, but we're just five minutes before that. That might be a good time to do it now before we start the motion. motion or go on to the next item. Adjourn the meeting. We can adjourn the meeting for 10 minutes. Okay. Coming back at five past eight, everybody, please. If you turn your cameras off and mute.